Thank you so much. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, I'm Mark Wethington, director of the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. Uh, this is the time of year I start thinking about this, uh, this kind of topic. Um, you know, after uh, we go back to, to daylight standard time, um, getting off work and coming home and it's already dark. And if you're like me, your uh, favorite thing to do is, uh, well, my favorite thing to do is when I get off of work, I come home and I take a walk uh, through the garden, um, usually with one of my um, dogs. The other dog will run off. The, one of my dogs likes walking around the garden with me just to get a kind of a daily look at what's going on. And uh, unfortunately, you know, it gets dark now, so you don't always get time to enjoy what, um, what I'm seeing out there. So, you know, I, it got me thinking a while back uh, about the, uh, you know, plants that you can appreciate after dark, not necessarily during the winter, but but um, throughout the year. Um, one of the first uh, is a Brugmansia. Now, Brugmansia is hardy for us in central North Carolina, zone 7B. Um, many of them are. Uh, others, not so much, but they can be grown in a pot and brought indoors. For us, they die back and you just mulch them really well. Uh, and while they are, they tend to be fairly fragrant throughout the day, by the end of the day uh, is really when they're, they're at their most fragrant, just, just delightful throughout the garden. And most all the Brugmansias I've grown have been really um, delightfully fragrant. Now, in, in colder climates, uh, they often, it's often very late in the season for them to start blooming. Uh, Brugmansia will need to get to about four feet or so before it, it starts flowering. Um, and so, you know, since it dies back and it really needs the, the ground to warm up, it can take it a while. Uh, that's one reason I like this one, Inca Sun. This is a, a smaller growing variety, and so it'll start flowering earlier in the season. It gets up to that, that flowering mature size by the time it's about two and a half or three feet tall rather than four or five. Uh, there are a lot out there. Um, Peaches and Cream is another really nice one with this white edge. Tends to be a little less hardy, probably more of a zone eight type plant. But again, um, the later in the season it is, I mean, the later in the day that it is, the more fragrant. And there are white ones and pink ones and peach ones and yellow. Um, some of the species come in more reds, uh, much much more tender um, of those, the, the Brugmansia sanguinea with, with the red flowers, but still, um, really beautiful, uh, beautiful plants. Um, another one uh, that's really known for their fragrance are the tuberoses. And uh, the tuberoses um, used to be known as Polyanthes tuberosa. Um, they have recently been moved into uh, as agaves, agave amica. I don't know. Um, they don't seem a lot like agaves to me, uh, but uh, this is what the the taxonomists uh, who are doing all this DNA work uh, say is, is the correct thing. These are delightfully fragrant. Um, they're hardy here in zone seven. They like a, a well-drained soil. Um, I guess that's easier to remember when you think of them as agaves uh, rather than polyanthes. Uh, well-drained soil and lots of sun. And they put up these spikes of, of white flowers, which are, um, you know, if you cut them and bring them inside, they can be almost overpowering indoors, but, but really beautifully uh, fragrant. Probably the most commonly grown um, form of tuberose is this old uh, selection with double flowers called the pearl. And the pearl is, is again, um, super fragrant, but it's really late in the day when you get that, that fragrance as uh, the, the volatiles in the, the flowers are um, 
have uh, warmed up throughout the day and you get that that really uh, delightful scent um, in the afternoon, kind of a, a grassy, strappy foliage uh, before it, it comes into flower. There are some other forms with some other colors. Uh, some of them are, are straight tuberose or agave amica. Others are um, hybrids with some other species. Um, but the, the color range is getting to be um, uh, pretty broad now. Um, oranges and yellows, uh, some bicolor ones, like these very similar ones, sunset and chirp. Uh, they look a little different in the guard. One of the main ways to tell chirp and sunset apart is chirp is pink towards the back and has speckling in the throat, whereas sunset is pink towards the, the uh, mouth of the flower and yellow farther back and is um, playing down, down the throat, but both um, great plants uh, for the garden. Again, well-drained soils, but that's, that's about all they need. I thought I had another one in there, maybe not. Um, lilies, another great plant. Um, not all lilies are fragrant and some lilies are fragrant most of the way through the day. Uh, the one that I really think of for the evening fragrance is the, the royal lily, Lilium regale, uh, which, which starts with these almost purple, burgundy purple buds then opens up to white flowers. And you can see on the back sides of those flowers, you can see that, that purpley um, streaking on the outside of the petals. And that can be to a more or lesser extent. Um, sometimes these are mislabeled. If they don't have any purple on there, they're often um, a different uh, species or a hybrid um, form of Sanum. But Lilium regale is just overpoweringly uh, fragrant again, but late in the day is when it really wafts through the gardens. And they're such good garden plants. You can see that it's just gonna open up more and more and more flowers um, and really be a show. Now, this is, it to me, is not the best way to grow them. I like to have them popping up through other plants because um, that helps them stay a little steadier uh, and, um, you know, covers up their, their knees a little bit more, but easy to grow. Um, many of the trumpet lilies are, are quite fragrant and um, will, uh, will look good throughout the season, as will the orientits, the ones that are oriental, uh, the Asiatic lilies crossed with the trumpet lilies. Um, very fragrant, but, but not all of them like this, uh, the royal lily really, really get fragrant at night. Um, there's several of the daylilies, uh, not true lilies, but the daylilies that are um, really quite evening fragrant. Um, this is actually an old garden of mine um, many years ago before I moved to, uh, to Raleigh. I actually need to start growing this again. This is Hemerocallus lilio asphodelus, which is, um, I always called it uh, the commuter daylily because it had such a great fragrance in the evening. You could stick your nose in it at noon, two o'clock and not smell a thing. And then by four or five, six o'clock, it really was um, scenting the garden. There's another species, uh, Hemerocallus uh, altissima, another species of daylily. Uh, one of my favorites is one called flyover, which is a really tall one, has flowers that, that sit up about four or five feet tall. Same yellow flower. Um, and uh, some people lump them together actually. Uh, but again, same thing, be fragrant uh, uh, late in the evening. And you know, with daylilies, they only open up for the day. So the, this Hemerocallus lilio asphodelus, really the flowers don't start opening up until late in the day. And then you get that fragrance. And then they're, um, by the next day, uh, they're fading. And, and then by the time they open up, you can see some old faded flowers still on there from the day before. So it really is just the succession of uh, flowers that open and are fragrant. And gingers. Um, I, it, that's one that I, 
Now, I have to confess to everybody, I don't have a very good sense of smell. And those of you who know me know, um, know that I don't have a great sense of smell. Uh, so I try to keep plants that I I, I didn't know were, were fragrance. And um, hedicums, many of them, uh, you know, I never paid attention um, just because they're so showy. Uh, and at some point, I'm not sure when it was, I started realizing that I, when I'd see them during the day, they didn't have any fragrance. But even me with my, my poor sense of smell, uh, late in the afternoon and into the evening, they would get more and more fragrant and really knock your socks off. And I actually have some, some texts in my phone from people, uh, some, some colleagues who you know collect plants and they'll send a picture of, of something that they've collected uh, the first time it comes into flower. And so I had a, a text with uh, one morning, well, early afternoon for me, it was morning on the West Coast where they took the picture saying, ah, here's that, here's that uh, ginger lily, that hedicium that collected in uh, Arunachal Pradesh. And it was a gorgeous plant with gold flowers and, and orange um, stamens, uh, the, the straight hedicium gardnerianum. And the question was, is it, is it very fragrant? And, you know, they couldn't answer it in the morning, but uh, I got an answer late in the evening that yes, as it got into afternoon and evening, it was very, very fragrant. And there are all kinds of, of uh, ginger lilies and, and many of them perfectly fine in zone seven, like this uh, Terra. Um, and there's a, a series called Thai, uh, oh, Thai pink, Thai conch, Thai river. I, I don't know. There's a bunch of, bunch of them with that tie in the name that are, that are very good um, for us. Um, four clocks, Mirabilis. Um, Mirabilis are a, a group of plants that are mostly native to the Southwest and um, down into South America. Um, this Mirabilis multiflora is one that is, is native to um, the Southeast, kind of Arizona, New Mexico, probably Texas. And you can see we're growing it in our uh, dry garden. Um, has these petunia-like flowers and it is in that same uh, family as petunias and the brugmansias, the solanaceous um, uh, family, which is great because most of those plants in that family have a uh, either not very good tasting or somewhat toxic um, or very toxic in some cases, uh, foliage. So they tend to keep um, the deer and other critters from eating them. Uh, probably uh, more often what you see are the, the true four clocks, uh, Mirabilis Jalapa um, from Mexico, from Jalapa, Mexico. This is a giant one called Baywatch with, with white flowers on very tall plants. And what I like to tell people about this, um, this group of plants, and they are zone eight hardy-ish. Um, they will often not survive in Raleigh, but often they will when we have warm winters. When they do, they form a big tuber. Um, when they don't, they will often seed around a bit. And um, so you'll get them popping up here and there, which I like. It leads to new combinations and keeps the plant going. Um, but, but what I always tell people is the Japanese beetles and, and June beetles love the foliage of four o'clocks, but it's poisonous to them. And so they will eat them and, uh, uh fall down dead. So I, uh, I think they are great companions for growing with hibiscus and with, um, roses and, and other things that those um, Japanese beetles like to munch on. Uh, they'll, they won't get rid of them, but they'll reduce the populations quite a bit. And we've, with these four clocks, um, sometimes called Marvel of Peru, you get lots of other colors. This is flaming fuchsia, misspelled fuchsia there. It should be fuchsia. Um, I just had a Dutch person visiting and he likes, he likes, he always calls them fuchsia. Um, 
but you can see this is in the morning. Uh, so all the flowers are, are closed up and finished because it, it, they open up at you know, four o'clock or so and last through the night, perfume the garden and then, um, then go away. Uh, there's another one that same flower color, but with uh, gold foliage. This just looks like a foliage is gold. It isn't really. Um, but I love these guys. And there are some other um, species. Again, a non a non hardy one, this Mirabilis longiflora. And you see those long tubes on there. And all of these night blooming uh, Mirabilis are um, pollinated by moths instead of the you know, butterflies and things. So you get these moths with long um, tongues to reach down there and get, get the nectar. Um, pretty cool little plants, but I love the texture. Even when the flowers aren't open, you'll have those long tubes that this is like, this is a flower that's closed. So you have these long tubes that are kind of closed up like that. And then um, just to me, it's, it's, it's really very cool in the garden. But they they really the fragrance in the evening is is spectacular. Now similar looking but quite different. Um, and I said I said the Mirabilis were, were in the Solanaceae family. That's not right. They're in the Nictigenaceae family. So if that's in the chat, um, which I haven't looked at yet, I'm sorry. I'm that's it's Nictigenaceae. Um. The 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 Nicotiana tobaccos, the flowering tobaccos, are in the Solanaceae flower family, and they have kind of similar, kind of a little bit similar to to this, except for the flowers hang down on this Nicotiana sylvestris. Um, not hardy here, but you get these big leaves uh, and these flowers that kind of in candelabras above the foliage all summer. And just when it stops, you know, when it finishes flowering, you just cut that flowering stalk back. And you can see if you look, there's more flowering stalks coming up on this same plant. And this is one, um, another one, um, in addition to the Mirabilis, that, uh, you know, the foliage is, um, is toxic to most insects. So they won't, uh, they won't eat it. And in fact, I know people who will grow different flowering tobaccos and they'll harvest leaves from them now again and they'll just throw them in a, a watering can and if there's something that the insects are, are uh, chomping on they'll, they'll pour some of that um, tobacco water on them and uh, really does a good job of, of keeping insects off until it rains once it rains it washes off and you have to do that again um, but you can take these these leaves kind of for a, a a home remedy um, for getting rid of insects. And I will say, I'm gonna show another picture of them, but right here in front of them, this is a combination of two different um, uh, flowering tobaccos. We have the taller Nicotiana sylvestris, and then underneath this, we have Nicotiana alata, uh, which is another um, plant that's, that used to be pretty commonly grown as a, uh, as, as a bedding perennial. Um, you don't see it so often anymore. I'm not sure why. I don't know if it's because people are afraid of tobacco or um, or what, um, but they do make really nice little little plants, almost like um, upright petunias. And you can see they they really flower quite heavily during the summer, mostly in whites and, and different shades of pink. Um, but there are some lime green ones and uh, some other ones that are kind of neat. Now, all of those are things that, you know, are most of those are, are plants that, you know, become more fragrant in the after in the late afternoon. And that's I didn't really mention that with these, but that is the case. Some things um, like moonflower open up uh, late, at, uh, you know, in the evening as it's getting dark. And you can kind of see the sun is you can see from that light in there, the sun is going down and this is opening up then. And it is fragrant at night, but it's only open at night. Uh, the four o'clocks kind of approach that as well, but it's kind of neat to be coming home from work and uh, seeing these. And they're cool with little kids because they're not as fast as you'd like from being closed to go and open, but you really can watch them 
uh, open up over the course of 15 or 20 minutes uh, in the evening. And it's, it's kind of a neat thing because you can kind of get a sense of when they're starting to go. They'll be all twisted up and just slowly untwist and open to these big um, four to six inch uh, flowers. But, you know, right now it's um, we're getting into uh, winter time. Um, and so I, you know, I'm getting home after dark. So that's all well and good to be fragrant after dark, but I'll be tripping over things uh, trying to, to see them. Um, so I do like plants that that do really show up at night. I've got a street light not too far from my house or when it's um, uh, really moonlit night, um, going out in the garden is pretty magical. Uh, some of the real silvery forms, uh, cardoon, or um, this is a related species, Cynara syriacus, um, but the, uh, many of the cardoons, um, they, they're, uh, they, they will grow uh, one seed. If you plant them kind of late in the season, the fall, they'll grow foliage. And then the next summer, they'll put up flower stalks and artichoke like fruits. Uh, I'll let them do that, let them flower uh, with those big eight foot tall um, purple thistle flowers, and then I'll cut it back. And when I do that, I usually cut back all the foliage because it starts to look kind of ratty after that. It starts to die back and it'll put out a few little leaves after that. But really, once it cools down and starts to cool down in the fall, it pops up with great foliage that looks good all season, through, all winter through, um, at least here in zone seven. I'm not quite sure how hardy they are, but um, certainly through zone seven. So right now in my garden, as other things are going dormant, this is still, this is just starting to look fabulous again. And it'll look great all the way through till the middle of next summer um, when it finishes flowering. So I love that. And the moonlight, uh, the light from lamps really um, uh, reflects off that, that silvery look. And so I look for that out in the, the garden for, for in the evenings. Um, things that are silvery or white during the winter. So I can still appreciate my garden when I come home at night. And, and they become pretty magical. Another one, uh, a sage that I'm not even going to show in flower. It's got little tufts of white flowers and it grows usually as a biennial, meaning um, you plant it out, you get this beautiful, fuzzy, broad patches of silvery leaves, and then it'll flower with white flowers and, and usually die. If you cut the flowers off before they completely fade and set seed, often they will, it'll come back. Um, I like to, to take the flowers off completely the first year it tries to flower and that gets it to offset a little bit. And then I'll let some of it flower and some not uh, each year. But, but this is a kind of a newly planted one um, that's just getting that silvery. This is one that's been in the ground and is gonna flower um, this year. You can kind of see it trying to form flower buds in there. But over the winter, they're just lovely. It almost looks like they're frost covering the, the plant um, all winter long. And it doesn't have to be um, just, uh, you know, herbaceous plants like, like these. Um, it can be woody plants. This Aves coriana silverlock kind of becomes just a, a beacon out in the garden. It, it reflects back every bit of light, no matter where you're standing, you know, in the garden. Now it's gorgeous during the day, uh, but at night it's it's even um, even more spectacular, I think, uh, in, in how it, it almost lights up the plants around it. And the way it does that is all the, the needles on um, Korean fir, uh, are white on the underside and on silver lock, all the needles are curved around. Um, so you see the bottom sides of all of those leaves. And I always like to tell people, this is one of the few plants that I've seen just about on, on every continent. I've seen it, this picture is actually from Japan. I've seen it in Japan and China and New Zealand and all over the, all over Europe. And I've seen it in the US and, and even in, um, I saw it in, Ecuador once in South America. So um, people love this plant kind of anywhere uh, you go. Of course, some of the silver palms, uh, Serenoa repens, 
um, the saw palmetto uh, is, um, is kind of marginally hardy here, but the silver form uh, usually goes go by Cineria is, is a slightly more hardy and a good 7B zone seven um, plant, uh, easily a, a probably a full zone hardier than the green one. Now in a really cold winter, it'll kill it back to the ground, um, but it'll, it'll come back uh, even fuller than before, especially if it's growing in a well-drained spot. And you can just see from this that uh, at nighttime, this is going to shine back all the light um, that you have. You know, if you have a, a, a mailbox that everybody keeps running over, somebody just ran over our mailbox at the, at the Arboretum, which is why I'm thinking about that. You know, planting this out there will help them out, um, maybe even more than a little uh, red uh, reflector, because um, that'll, that'll give you some feedback from your headlights for sure. Um, you can grow it out in full sun. It's real happy that way, but it actually tolerates um, high shade very well. Um, and uh, it, can, it can make almost a little colony, really beautiful little, little um, you know, four or five foot tall and wide uh, uh, palm for subshrubs. Now I've shown a lot of silver plants and that's, those are really ones I think of, um, but this nacella or stipa tenuissima is a grass, um, sometimes called ponytail grass or, or Mexican feather grass. Um, this is a great one because that, that um, kind of a dusky uh, tan does reflect light, not as well as the silver, but it moves with just the slightest breeze. You get it kind of swaying back and forth. Um, and, and it's one of the few plants that I really feel like you can see that movement, uh, which is so, so great in a garden, um, but you can see it at night. Our own native um, muley grass is another one that does that really well. It's a little bit stiffer and the, the flowers don't show up as well unless you're growing um, the Mullenbergia capillaris, which have um, the lighter colored flowers, not the pink. Um, but, but I do like that for the, the evening garden. And of course, you know, going back to those polyanthes or agave, uh, amicas is, are the true agaves. Um, not all of them, the green ones aren't great for, for, um, being showy at night. And if you're going to wander around in the, the garden at night, you don't want to wander around too many agaves that aren't reflecting back light like these, um, uh, whale tongue agaves, the uh, vatifolia, uh, like frosty blue, because bumping into those can be um, bad for your health. Uh, but these really do um, shine in, in the garden. Um, so there's just a few things to kind of get your get the the juices flowing out in in the garden. Um, you know, of course, the other way to enjoy the the garden in the evening is is to light it up. Um, this is the arboretum during um, moonlight in the garden, where we do uh, light up plants. I um I I think that this next year we have moonlight in the garden. We ought to bring in black lights as well. Um, Jenks Farmer uh, from South Carolina was telling me about a garden he was designing for somebody. And the viewpoint of the garden was up on a, a raised porch. And the person entered who had the party, had the, the house that this, this garden was being designed for, did a lot of entertaining, did a lot of entertaining out on the porch. And so in the evenings, and so Jinx was finding all these flowers, both white flowers, but also things that um, really lit up under black lights. And he was placing black lights all through his this garden. And so you were going to get things that really fluoresced well, um, purples and, and blues. And if you've ever seen any of those things about how like bees and pollinators see plants, you know, they see like runways on irises that that don't show up under regular light. Um, I guess it'd be a really cool um, uh, way to, to think about uh, about the garden. And uh, I'd like to show some more of that off sometime at our garden when we have it open in the evenings. 
So I'd love to answer any questions people have, um, any thoughts they have, uh, any issues they have. Chris? Um, no, the questions in the chat have already been answered. I did give a thumbs up to the black light, so I want to see that done in the future. But if anyone's any more questions, go ahead and unmute yourself or ask the questions in the chat and we can get to them. Ooh, someone just asked about the availability of Brugmansia, and Paul was mentioning the Inca Sun is um, not all that available at, anymore. Yeah, so um, Brugmansias you can usually get from specialty mail order places. We usually offer a, a few of them. Um, often we'll, we do cuttings of Inca Sun and offer those at our plant sales. Um, Charles Grimaldi is another one that we often offer. Uh, in fact, I think we have a whole bunch in our greenhouse now, so they'll probably avail be available at our spring sale. Um, but uh, specialty mail order nurseries are often the best place to to get them. And, you know, as Paul mentioned that sometimes ones that are fantastic kind of become passe and new ones come in and there are probably a bunch of great new ones. And I just haven't grown them uh, uh, recently. Yep. And Nancy just asked, how big does Agavio Vatafolia Frosty Blue get? Oh, it can get. Uh, Usually doesn't grow more than uh, two feet tall, maybe 30 inches, but it can get 40 inches um, wide, uh, you know, so it's, it's lower and wider. And then when it flowers, the flower stalks uh, 15, 20 feet tall. And then the plant dies, unfortunately. We had a beautiful one on our monocot mound that flowered was really cool, but it's, it's dead now. It's kind of worth it though. The flowers are impressive. It is. Although I have one out, that was one of the first plants I planted out in front of my, right in front of my house where it can reflect the light for when people comes over um, for at, in the evening. And I dread the day that it, it flowers. Um, yeah. And Nancy knows, I see this. Um, if you know somebody with Brugmansia, they are very easy from to start from cuttings. It feels weird because you're cutting stems that are, big chunky things like that, but you just, um, you take your cuttings, you know, about so tall, doesn't even have to have leaves on them. Just make sure they're the right way up and stick them straight in a one gallon container with, um, with good potting soil and keep it just moist, not too wet, just moist. And they'll, they'll root really easily. I, I put in the comments earlier that one of our volunteers overwinters them that way. She cuts the stems and just keeps them in a dry, cool spot and then roots them in the spring because they don't make a very good house plant. They will get spider mites in about a millisecond when you bring them in. And, and white flies. You can yeah. never have had a white fly in your house and somehow they will appear out of nowhere. Um, spontaneous generation of life there um, and they will have it. Um, so what is the best way to light plants at night? Um, placement and kind. So the best kind are LEDs. They're, they're, they are incredibly uh, energy efficient. Um, you could light your entire garden with LED lights and it would probably draw the same amount of power as you know the two lights, incandescent lights um, flanking your doorway. Really LEDs are, in my mind, the only way to go. Um, as for placement, um, you know, it really depends on the effect you want. But I will say this, after working with John Garner at Southern Lights on our, our Moonlight in the Garden um, thing, I would have told you that I'm pretty good at placing um, uh, landscape lights. And now I know I don't, I'm terrible at it. He is, you know, it, it really is a skill and you can light plants easily it's much harder to light them well to really think about what what you want so that picture of the the uh the yuccas the tree yuccas that i showed you know wanted to display you know really light those in a certain way and really the viewpoint was from up above so that changed how you did it you would light a a you know weeping japanese maple in a different way and it may be that you're lighting it up from underneath. It may be that you're doing lights down, maybe that there's a combination. So um, that's, you know, that's kind of a real art. Um, and solar lights are inexpensive and they seem great. They just don't work very well. Um, 
they really don't. Uh, low voltage lighting is easy to install, uh, easy to do, and it's it just makes so much more sense than than um, yeah. The new solar LEDs are are pretty powerful now, but they start you know your plants grow, they get shaded, um, then they they don't work very well. You've got to really um, really take care of them, and the, those little solar panels tend to not last terribly long. Although I've got some on my porch on like little rail lights that have been going for four or five years now. So, you know, they, With they the last for a while. Light. You should be careful for choosing the color temperature because you can mix them and wind up with cool whites and warm whites and that can start looking a little bit weird. So choose your color temperatures correctly, whichever way you want to go. Yeah. And that's a good point. You know, LEDs used to all be that kind of bright clinical blue white um, color. Yes. You can get them in all different um, warmth temperatures, not not actual physical temperatures, but everything from that from a kind of a, a warm orangish, you know, to pink to blue kind of um, like you can with with incandescent lights. And it does make a big difference. And let me tell you, if you have all one kind of light out there and you put in one that's a different uh, warmth, it will make a, you, it'll jump out like a sore thumb. Although in some cases you may want to do that again, if you really know what you're doing and are trying to produce different effects. I had an anonymous question over here, Mark. Uh, someone's wanted to know, do we cut down our Brugmansias and at the Arboretum for the winter or just mulch them? Yeah, we cut them down. They even in our mild winters, the tops um, really get hit. We'll we'll often leave them up for a while. The tops will die. We'll just leave them up. Um, but you know, once they're dormant, you can you can really cut them back anytime. But you do want to make sure you do want to wait until it gets good and cold. Um, you know, if you had said, "Oh, last week it's it's cold. We're, we got all cold temperatures," and you cut it back, and then um, this week. You know, it starts warming up some. You can push them into growth, and you don't want to do that. You want to wait to cut them back until they are good and dormant. Yep. And I'm working on another one, Mark. We had another anonymous comment. Someone asked or commented that they love the midweek programs and was wondering if there is a link that we can share to help support these kind of programs. And I was gonna mention that the wish list was sent out in the mail very recently. I got mine a couple of days ago, and that does include um, category to add or support the uh, online programs. Maybe not necessarily the, the midweek ones, but it can support them. And I'm gonna put that in the chat right now. And you can make a contribution on that page. Yeah, and you know that's there's that's a specific one there. You can always go to um, jcra.ncsu.edu um, and click on the support button and just make a donation. And there's a, a comment box you can put there, and you can say, you know, I love the online programs. I want to support them, um, and that money we we use it for new equipment. Um, you know, uh, better computers, better. Uh, uh, email access on our wish list. Um, what we really want to do is uh, our auditorium at work um, right now, Chris is making it work with some hybrid programming. He's doing a fantastic job. We've got great volunteers who are filming people and we're really trying to set it up so that everybody feels included. It doesn't feel like a live program for the people in the room and the online folks get it, get it as an add-on, but really want everybody to feel like they're part of the class. And we'd really like to set the room up to be able to do that seamlessly. So it isn't, does it involve, you know, three or four people and multiple computers and um, external cameras and all these kinds of things, but, but ones where um, the participants at home can chat with the, the lecturers and the, the other people in the room. And it can be a really, um, immersive experience and inclusive experience for, for everybody. Yep. And the wish list also includes some computers for the education group, which would help support midweek itself. Yes. Yes. So thank you for asking about that. I, I put the uh, link to the wish list in the um, chat and I also put the overall giving page to the chat as well. 
Yeah, we appreciate that. Um, yep. Appreciate that. And, you know, and it helps to, um, you know, if you're not in a position to be able to give, but you like these, um, go to our YouTube page and um, uh, subscribe to the, to the YouTube page and hit the little bell thing so you'll know when new things come up. Because even if you've come, you come every week to this program, there are other things coming up all the time on there that, that Chris is, is loading up. Um, yeah, it's uh, any of that um, support helps. The, in addition to the midweek programs, our YouTube channel gets our Friends of the Arboretum lectures, um, our Gardening in the South program, the North American Rock Garden Society lectures, the Extension Master Gardener lectures. So there's a, a lot of program available made for free on YouTube. So that, that's a good place to go. So definitely do subscribe. Um, but I was just thinking about one plant mark that I can't believe you didn't include in your presentation. Either that or I was typing in the chat and I missed it. You didn't put osmanthus in there. You know, you're you're right. Um, well, I, I think of osmanthus as most of them as fragrant all day, although osmanthus yep. heteropolis does seem to be um, even more fragrant at night. Um, but but I, you know, I when I arrive at work in the morning when they're flowering, I can I can smell them. So <laughs> I was trying to do the ones that really are more fragrant late in the, the day. I, I, thought I, was, I, I thought you were going to say night blooming serious. No, 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 not hardy. So I wouldn't include that one. But I, I was just thinking of the osmanthus that we had near the lath house that everyone always asked about during Moonlight the Garden. Yeah, yeah, that one um, <laughs> def definitely, uh, it does get better and better later in the day. This question, how about Iliagnus? Um, you know, certainly I was standing out at my car just yesterday morning at at. 10-ish and the Eliagnus was swell, smelling wonderfully then. So I don't know if it is stronger at night or not. It's certainly fragrant. Um, it's, uh, um, so I, I don't know if it gets stronger later in the day. Sorry, I was, I was laughing at someone's commented here. <laughs> Carolyn said her osmanthus is two years old and doesn't seem to be, be fragrant. And then she says, I don't have COVID, ha ha. <laughs> Sorry. Flowering, it should be fragrant. Yeah, um, yeah that would be disappointing if it, if it wasn't fragrant. My, it, and although it does seem like there needs to be kind of a critical mass of osmanthus, a critical size for it to really get fragrant because Osmanthus were some of the first plants I put in my garden. And this year was one of the first years that I really, really noticed them. Of course, I'm usually traveling through much of October um, and that's when they, they flower a lot. But um, yeah, I think maybe they need to get, you know, to a bit of a size. Well, it certainly is one of the ones that are very fragrant from a distance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the most outstanding ones. Well, I do think that takes care of all the questions in the chat, unless someone has a last minute question. Otherwise, we're good to go, Mark, it looks like. Yeah, th there was a comment that bluish or grayish uh, plants, Opuntia cacanapa is very nice. And that's the one that goes around as Opuntia elisiana. It's the spineless one. So, and with really beautiful blue pads. So that is true. I didn't even think about Opuntia. All right. Well, thank you all. all. This has been a, a lot of fun. Thank, thank you, so you much. very much. My pleasure. Thanks for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Yes. Have a good week. Enjoy the nice warm weather while it lasts. Thank you. Time to get out and garden the last few days. <laughs>